One of the key aspects of the human immune system is the ability to develop long-term immunity after having been exposed to a pathogen in a previous time. Immunity is rooted in two key aspects of the immune system, memory and specificity. If you recall from my previous videos, our body is able to develop memory B cells and memory T cells as a way of establishing long-term immunity to prior infections. This means that in many cases, subsequent exposure to those pathogens results in either no illness at all or our body is able to respond much faster to the exposure to that pathogen, meaning that the illness is less severe. This is the reason why, for example, vaccinations are effective. And immunity is rooted in two key aspects of our immune system, memory and specificity. In this video, we'll talk about the different types of immunity that we can have as human beings. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. In this video, we're going to be talking about the different types of immunity. So as you recall, immunity is rooted in two key aspects of our immune system, memory and specificity. And what we're going to talk about in this video is the different ways in which immunity can be acquired, as well as the type of immunity that gets conferred. So let's talk quickly about what I mean by that. So, for example, immunity can be acquired in two main ways, either naturally or artificially. When we talk about natural immunity, we're talking about immunity that comes from an exposure to a natural source. For example, being exposed naturally to a pathogen or by receiving some sort of natural product as part of a normal biological process such as breastfeeding. We can also acquire immunity artificially. When we talk about artificial immunity, we're talking about being exposed or being given some type of immune product through medical means typically. So for example, vaccination is a great example of artificial immunity. So is giving somebody IgG antibodies that will help reduce the severity of a given infection. But the other thing we have to think about is how is that immunity being conferred within the body? So for example, there is active immunity. And active immunity occurs when, somebody, when somebody's body is actively responding to the, exposure, uh, to the exposure to a pathogen or to some sort of immunogen. So for example, when you're exposed to a pathogen in the wild, um, your first time being exposed to uh, a virus, for example, your body is going to actively develop immunity against that through the processes that we've talked about in some of my other videos. The same could also be said when you're exposed to a vaccination. So when you're inoculated against something, there are different ways that vaccinations work, but your body is basically being tricked. It's being exposed to some type of immunogen that's trying to train your immune system. But that's still considered active immunity because your body has to go through and develop the memory cells needed to help remember that infection in the future. On the other hand, passive immunity occurs when we're giving somebody antibodies, for example. A natural way this could occur is through breastfeeding. So when a mother breastfeeds her infant, she'll be delivering antibodies that she's produced against things that would help that could be harmful to the baby. That is a, a passive process in the fact that the baby isn't developing his or her own antibodies. She's just using the ones that mom's delivered. We can do this artificially by delivering people antibodies. Uh, oftentimes these are either created in a lab or they are harvested from somebody who's been previously exposed to the particular pathogen we're trying to protect this patient against. So if you look at it in terms of like a table, um, on one axis, you're going to have whether this is some type of artificial or natural immunity. And on the other, you're going to talk about whether it is um, where it, wh what type of immunity is. Is it, is it active or is it passive? So in one corner of this box, what you're going to have is natural active immunity. Natural active immunity is going to be what happens when someone is exposed to a pathogen in the wild. So if you contract strep throat from somebody, you catch the flu, you get some type of virus, your body is going to be exposed to that pathogen. It, as long as you're immunocompetent, is going to develop, it's going to go through the whole processes of acknowledging the infection, 
building up the cells that are going to be needed to help fight that infection and as part of that process you're going to hopefully develop memory t cells and memory b cells so that your body remembers that infection and then a subsequent exposure to that particular pathogen won't result in such a pronounced infection sometimes you don't get the infection at all other times you may get it but it might be less severe if we go down to the next corner we'll stay in the lane of of active immunity but we'll do artificial active immunity and that's what happens when you're given a vaccination so if you get a vaccination and we'll talk later on in this video about different types of vaccines when you get exposed to the particular immunogen that's in that particular vaccine what's going to happen is your body's basically going to be tricked into thinking that it's being attacked by a pathogen and we'll talk about the different ways that vaccines do this but the, the bottom line is basically the same with with natural or with artificial active uh, immunity. What's happening is your body is going to mount an immune response against some sort some sort of artificial exposure to the pathogen. Usually you've been exposed through a vaccine. Um, whatever the immunogen is tricks your body into thinking you're being infected. It's going to go through the whole process that it would if it were actually exposed to a live pathogen. And it's going to build up those memory B and memory T cells in some cases, uh, and that's going to help fight off subsequent infections. If we drop down and we talk about passive immunity, or we talk about uh, our, uh, we talk about passive immunity, when we talk about natural passive immunity, what we're really talking about is, in many cases, is a natural way in which you're being given immune products. The easiest one to understand really is breastfeeding. So when a mother breastfeeds her infant, she's going to deliver her custom made antibodies. And that's gonna be given through the breast milk to that infant. Now, this is natural because it is occurring through the natural process of breastfeeding, but it's also passive. And the reason why is the infant is not actually developing their own immune response. So they're not, usually within the first six months to a year, infants really don't have a full-fledged immune system at that point. They're really relying in large part, at least for the first six months, on mom's antibodies because their immune system isn't online. They're not going to mount the full immune response. They're not going to be able to produce memory B and memory T cells. But the fact that mom is providing antibodies against many of the things that could be pathogenic to that infant is conferring some type of immunity. But it is passive because really what's happening is mom has to continually, continually deliver this stream of antibodies because once those antibodies have either been consumed or broken down or just eliminated from the body, more are needed to replace it because the baby's still not making their own. If we go to artificial passive immunity, uh, this often happens when we deliver, for example, IgG or IgM antibodies that have been harvested from uh, somebody who's been previously exposed. So uh, this has happened a couple of times uh, in recent history in the U.S. Um, back in 2014 when there was an Ebola outbreak in the U.S., uh, a couple of people were exposed and a couple of them were actually treated with antibodies that were harvested from uh, previous Ebola patients. And that uh, was believed to confer some sort of protection allowing their body uh, to fight off that Ebola infection. It was also used early on during the COVID pandemic where a couple of pharmaceutical companies were in the process of developing um, a way of harvesting uh, antibodies from previous COVID patients and then using it to treat current COVID patients. So if you look at immunity in terms of this diagram where you've got uh, the, the type of immunity, whether it's artificial or natural, and you've also got the way it's conferred, either passive or active, uh, you can see that there are lots of different ways that our body can acquire immunity to pathogens. Okay, so for the next part of this video, I want to talk about vaccinations. So vaccines are a form of artificial active immunity. It's artificial because the way the immunity is delivered is through some type of um, medical process. But it is active because when we give somebody a vaccination, we are relying on their body to develop immunity through the natural processes that the immune system uses to build up a memory to a given infection. And there are a few different types of vaccinations that currently exist. Um, the first we'll start talking about 
uh, would be the attenuated virus vaccines. So attenuated virus vaccines work typically by taking a live strain of whatever virus that you're trying to develop immunity against and then finding some way to weaken it. Um, oftentimes this is done by exposure to heat or to certain chemicals and the way or, or, or through mutating the virus itself um, genetically. What they try to do is make the virus weakened to the point where it um, can't really cause a widespread infection in a healthy individual. Uh, usually it either makes it sort of replication deficient so that it can't replicate once it gets into the host cell or it's weakened to the point where the body has a very easy chance of fighting it off. So attenuated virus vaccines are very helpful. One of the most common, or a couple of the more common ones that you might encounter in terms of the attenuated virus vaccine, flu mist uh, is an example of one, as well as the MMR. So the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine confers immunity against three different uh, viral pathogens, the measles virus, the mumps virus, and the rubella virus. All three of the viruses that are within that single vaccination have been degraded in a way where they do cause a small minor infection, uh, which causes the body to mount an immune response, but they're weakened to the point where in a healthy individual, they won't spread throughout the body, actually causing the mumps or causing measles or causing rubella. Um, so there are lots of pros to this particular approach. First and foremost, when somebody's exposed to an attenuated virus vaccine, it will actually infect the host cells. And that's a good thing because some of those host cells need to be infected in order for the body to mount an immune response. This means that things like dendritic cells are gonna be infected. And when those dendritic cells actually go to the lymph node to do antigen presentation, they are not only going to trigger the response of helper immune cells, CD4 positive immune cells, but they're also going to trigger a response from CD8 positive or killer T cells. So why is that important? Well, if you don't activate the CD8 positive killer T cells, those can't differentiate long-term into memory CD8 positive cells. And since these are viral, vac viral pathogens, you really do wanna have killer T cells at your beck and call the next time you're exposed because that's the primary means your body's going to use to fight off that infection. So attenuated, attenuated virus vaccines are very helpful because not only do you get helper T cells activated, but you get killer T cells activated. Of course, you will also get B cells activated through their own pathway, and they will be co-stimulated by some of those helper T cells that are activated during the initial antigen presentation. And as a result, people who are exposed to attenuated virus vaccines tend to develop the full gamut of memory cells. They'll have CD4 positive memory T cells, CD8 positive memory T cells, and uh, memory B cells. The good news is those memory B cells, those, uh, those T cells, they're gonna spread throughout the body. So now that you're, now you're actually going to have uh, memory B cells in all of your lymph tissue, you're gonna have me memory CD4 positive, memory T cells located throughout your lymph nodes, but you're also gonna have um, CD8 positive memory T cells. Uh, and those, those T cells are gonna be scattered throughout the body, lymph nodes and in the tissue. And what's gonna happen is hopefully when somebody's exposed to those viruses, uh, a subsequent exposure is going to be responded to significantly faster and the individual will not develop any sort of symptoms of that infection. However, there are some downsides to attenuated virus vaccines. First and foremost, uh, these attenuated virus vaccines are, are safe if the individual is healthy. You can't give these, uh, these particular vaccines to people who are immunocompromised in any way. Um, and if somebody is actually sick with some other illness, there's a potential that the body could be too overwhelmed and somebody exposed to attenuated virus vaccine might have a much stronger reaction. They might actually develop more of the signs and symptoms of the infection um, of that particular virus. The other thing is that there is the possibility that the processes used to create the attenuated virus, um, you know, they could be reversed through mutation. So, you know, you mutate these by exp exposure to chemical mutagens in that you know, renders the virus weakened and unable to cause an infection, but natural selection exists. Mutations happen. There is the possibility that a freak mutation could revert one of these to a more active, um, more virulent form of the virus. 
So you really kind of have to pick and choose which viruses you're going to develop vaccines this way. What I want to stress is there's an incredibly low risk of any of these things happening with the MMR vaccine. This is something that's been around for a very long time and its track record is exceptional. All these virus vaccines have to go through rigorous testing before they get utilized in the general public. So the risk is very low, but it's still present. So we have to be careful when we use these attenuated virus vaccines, we have to be careful about who we're giving them to. Um, you can't give it to somebody who has leukemia. You can't give them to somebody who has a full blown, you know, who has the flu already because you're just gonna put too much stress on the system. It also means that this isn't a great route, for example, to produce a vaccine against HIV. A weakened HIV virus is still the HIV virus and could still cause AIDS essentially in a person uh, who, who is exposed to this. So the attenuated virus vaccine route was not a logical process for most vaccinologists to attempt to produce a, a vaccine against HIV. So there are pros and cons to attenuated virus vaccines. The other way we try to confer immunity through vaccinations is to use non-infectious vaccinations. So non-infectious vaccinations can contain uh, several different immunogens as a way of helping the body to trigger an immune response. But the key here is they're not using any type of active pathogen, a weakened one or otherwise. So the way these typically work, for example, uh, in some cases they use a fully killed virus. The vaccine, the virus is totally inactivated. It can't do anything infectious. It's basically a dead virus, but because it's still the virus, it has all the parts that allow the immune system to recognize it and mount an immune response. Sometimes it's a toxoid. So for example, when we talk about the uh, tetanus portion of the DTaP vaccine, the T, um, that actually uses the toxoid as immunogen. So when you get infected with Clostridium tetani, it really isn't the bacterium that causes the issue, it's the fact that it produces an exotoxin. So to trigger an immune response, to develop immunity against this, we include a, a, a mutated version of the tetanospasmin exotoxin. It can't actually cause any sort of illness, but it looks so much like the natural toxin that's in, that's produced by uh, C. tetani, that your body is able to mount an immune response, develop antibodies and helper T cells that recognize it so that if you do get infected with Clostridium tetani, your body already has antibodies ready to produce to target that uh, tetanus toxin that gets produced and your body can fight off the infection. <clears throat> Another novel way of doing it is by using subunits. So the, the, when you look at the DTaP vaccine, it's the D for diphtheria, it's the T for tetanus. Uh, for both of those, you're actually getting the toxoids for diphtheria and tetanus. And then the AP actually stands for acellular pertussis. Basically, it's a subunit, it's pieces, it's proteins that are found on the, on the bacterium Bordetella pertussis and your body recognizes these little pieces. It develops helper T cells that recognize it. Those form a memory against those. Uh, your body also produces B cells that can produce antibodies that target those various subunits of, a, of, of the pertussis bacterium. And as a result, if you're ever exposed to Bordetella pertussis, all that has to happen is your body just remembers that you were, starts producing those antibodies, and they're able to uh, target that particular bacterium and eliminate it from your body fairly quickly. This same subunit route is actually the way the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine was produced. They basically took the protein spike found on the surface of the COVID-19 virus, put it inside the vaccine, delivered it, uh, it, um, delivered it basically wrapped in like lipids and proteins, uh, into the body, um, that gets taken up by dendritic cells, they unpack it, they carry it into the, the lymph node, and they basically show it around, do antigen presentation to uh, helper T cells. Some of that protein spike gets produced, uh, gets washed into uh, the lymph vessels, that triggers a B cell response, and in the end you develop a nice, uh, robust antibody response uh, and helper T cell response to that particular um, that particular protein spike. And what should happen is if you ever are exposed naturally to COVID-19, your body already has the tools to recognize COVID-19 very early on in the infection, rapidly mount an immune response and eliminate it from the body so that you either don't develop any sort of signs and symptoms of the infection or the, symptom, the severity of the symptoms is significantly less. Another type of non-infectious vaccine really 
became more prominent during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, two of the most common vaccines utilized to combat COVID-19 in the United States during the COVID-19 pandemic were produced by Moderna and Pfizer, and they were the first commercially available mRNA vaccinations uh, ever produced. So um, the way mRNA vaccinations actually confer immunity, immunity is different than the other two routes. And the thing I wanna point out about the COVID-19 vaccinations uh, or mRNA vaccinations as a whole is there was this misconception early on that these mRNA vaccines were entirely new, nobody had ever thought about them, and they're producing this new way of, of, of producing a vaccine that's completely untested and nobody's thought about it, and how can it be safe? The thing to realize is this, mRNA vaccinations have been a topic of vaccine research for several decades. There just really wasn't the need or the push or the resources available to develop an mRNA vaccine prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. And what we saw during the pandemic was Moderna and Pfizer both produced independently mRNA vaccinations that would help prevent COVID infection. So how do mRNA vaccinations work? Well, we have to remember how our body produces proteins. So if you recall, the process of producing proteins re normally requires uh, DNA, RNA polymerase to convert a gene into mRNA, and then that mRNA has to be delivered to the ribosome where that ribosome turns it into a protein. The way mRNA vaccinations work is by providing those mRNA instructions to the cell. And the way Pfizer and Moderna both approach it was this. They isolated and identified the protein, the amino acid sequence of the protein spike on the surface of COVID-19. They then produced a synthetic mRNA that when translated by a ribosome would lead to the production of that protein. Now, just like we saw with subunit vaccines, the protein spike is not, the, not able to actually cause any sort of uh, any sort of illness, right? Because it's just the protein spike. There's no genome from COVID-19. There's no actual virus there. It's just a piece of the virus that allows the body to go, oh yeah, so if I see that again, I should respond. So what happens with an mRNA virus is you, you take the mRNA, you package it into lipids and proteins, and then deliver it to the body through injection. The cells of that person's body then take up that mRNA. And importantly, you get things like dendritic cells and macrophages and the immune cells taking up this lipid-coated mRNA, unpackaging it, and then those cells' ribosomes are actually able to translate that to make the protein spike. This allows things like dendritic cells and other antigen-presenting cells to travel to the lymph node, act like they've been infected with a virus because they're producing a viral protein, They've also consumed a viral protein, so they do proper antigen presentation to both helper T cells and killer T cells, activating both T cell branches, as well as some of that protein being utilized to activate B cells. As a result, you get a full-blown immune response because your body's producing temporarily this viral protein. Here's the cool part. The mRNA over time eventually degrades and leaves your body entirely. It can't hang around. It can't be integrated into your genome. It can't be transferred from one person to the next. None of these things can happen because the mRNA has a shelf life. It has a, a half-life like all other mRNAs, and eventually the mRNA is gone, but not before your body's built a strong immune response to that exposure to develop memory CD4 positive T cells, memory CD8 positive T cells, and memory B cells. So your body gets the advantage of a full-blown exposure to the virus with nothing potentially pathogenic being delivered to it. It's awesome. The other really cool part about mRNA vaccines is they are easier to make. Most other vaccines, particularly for viruses, require you, you to infect a healthy cell, usually a chicken egg, which means you need millions and millions of chicken eggs to ramp up production. You need to isolate that particular toxoid or that particular virus and, and then attenuate it and then inactivate it. You don't have to do that with mRNA vaccines. You can create them artificially in a lab. You can make trillions of copies of messenger RNA in a matter of minutes, package them up the right way, and then deliver it to the host uh, via injection. The one thing we learned is that your body needs about two shots. You need, a, you need the initial vaccine, and then you need the booster in order to get full immunity. But that's not abnormal. That is a normal process that happens. For example, with the MMRs, you need a booster 
every so often. Um, and it requires a series of shots to develop immunity. Meningitis vaccines typically require uh, the initial vaccine plus a booster. You get it anytime you step on a rusty nail, somebody's going to give you a new Tdap vaccine. Most virus vaccines need boosters. Most vaccines in general need boosters over time. We just learned that with these mRNA vaccines, you need an initial exposure and then you need a booster a few weeks later to sort of hijack and impress that immune system into full response. But there was so much disinformation out there about these mRNA vaccines that a lot of people refuse to take them. And what we've learned over the past three or so years is that these vaccines are completely safe. Yes, a lot of people develop strong immune responses to the point where you probably know somebody, myself, when I got vaccinated, I had a very strong immune response. I was down for like a whole day. That's not a bad thing. That means your body is responding appropriately. That sickness that you feel, the swelling, the pain, the soreness, the swelling of your lymph nodes, that's your body responding. You're not getting COVID. Your body's acting like it has COVID which is what you want when you get exposed to a vaccine. You want your body to think it's infected. You might feel lousy for a day or two, but you're not actually exposed to anything that's gonna make you ill. You're not gonna die from it. You're just gonna have an immune response. Your body will remember that, and then your body will respond much more robustly. The other thing that people got confused about um, with regard to the COVID vaccinations, no matter which one you took, was some people would say, well, I got the vaccination and I still got the virus. Yeah, I mean, like that happens, right? So you can get the flu vaccine and still get the flu. But what most people don't understand is that chances are the your body's experience with that particular virus. So, for example, we know with COVID-19, people who got one of the vaccines were much less likely to be hospitalized for getting COVID. So they may have gotten COVID. And it may not have been particularly fun, but at no point were they ever in danger of going on a respirator or potentially dying from it. So they may have gotten sick, they may have felt lousy, but the incidence of hospitalization in vaccinated individuals was significantly less than the incidence of hospitalization for people who were unvaccinated. So when we talk about mRNA vaccines or any of the other non-infectious vaccines, the good news is this, you're not going to actually get the infection from that particular vac from that particular vaccination you're completely safe it's a subunit it's a toxoid it's a completely dead virus being used to trick your body into mounting an immune response the downside to some of them is they don't activate both branches of t of t cell immunity so mrna vaccines seem to do that but the traditional subunit vaccines, the toxoid vaccines, or the inactivated virus vaccines aren't going to do that. And the main reason why is in order to get helper T cells, I'm sorry, in order to get killer T cells activated in response to a vaccine, that dendritic cell needs to be infected with a virus. And a dead virus or a toxoid or a subunit can't cause an actual infection in that dendritic cell, which means you're not going to get CD8 positive killer T cells activated in response, which means you're missing one of those branches of your T cell immunity. On the other hand, the mRNA vaccines seem to actually trigger that response, which means you're getting a better type of immunity out of that. And I fully expect we're gonna see more mRNA vaccines come onto the market sooner rather than later in the future, simply because of the ease with which we can produce these, uh, the speed which, 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 with which they can be produced and their non-infectious nature are exceedingly helpful. The last thing I'll close with is a conversation about herd immunity. So there's been a lot of talk about herd immunity over the past couple of years, uh, largely with some people arguing that it was a valid approach um, to COVID-19, that we should just let everybody get infected. And then once we've all been infected, we'll all have herd immunity. But um, the people who were proposing this really didn't fully grasp the nature of what we were dealing with. So herd immunity is what happens when a significant proportion of a population have been exposed to an infectious agent, either naturally or artificially, okay? Uh, usually you need at least 75% of the population or better to be exposed for herd immunity to be a thing. But in many cases, for example, measles, which is highly infectious, requires in the neighborhood of 94 to 96% of the population to be immune for herd immunity to actually work. The, the key is this. The idea is basically this. If a significant proportion of the population are immune, either naturally or artificially, to a particular pathogen, the pathogen just runs into dead ends. 
essentially I may get it because I'm not immune, but I can't really spread it to anybody else because everybody else I know is immune. I get the infection. I get the signs and symptoms. Nobody else does, right? So that's why the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine is so important. As long as we maintain a high level of vaccination rates within the United States, it's really hard for measles to come roaring back and cause lots of infections. Because if one person is unvaccinated and gets exposed to it, they may get it, but everybody else they know is vaccinated, which means they're not likely going to get it, okay? But what we've seen in the past few years is that we end up with these little pockets where vaccination rates aren't as high as they are nationwide. And what we've seen in a couple of major cities, uh, a couple in California, and there was one in New York City, um, within these communities, there were these localized measles outbreaks where people actually got it and spread it. And the thing to realize is measles is a pretty serious infection and can cause serious long-term consequences or even death. Um, so, you know, that was a particularly scary thing to start seeing. The problem with COVID-19 when it came to herd immunity, uh, well, there were lots of problems. First and foremost, um, even though the mortality rate for COVID was less than 1%, we essentially had 7 billion people on the planet Earth that didn't ever have exposure to it. So even at 1% of 7 billion, that's a lot. And the thing to realize is that um, if you, in the hospitalization rate was even higher than 1%, right? So realize that if like one to 3% of any country's population suddenly and spontaneously had to go to the hospital because of an infection that would overrun any healthcare system in the world, like that's just too many people. That's still hundreds or thousands or millions of people, depending on the country that need hospitalization. We just don't have that many hospital beds in the country, right? The, the other problem is, is we don't know what percentage of the population needed to be exposed to confer that herd immunity. So we could end up with millions of people dying and herd immunity still not being achieved through the natural exposure. So really just a bad idea on the onset to just rely on herd immunity. But once we started developing vaccinations, the herd immunity could be done safely. And that's the key. We want herd immunity to happen, but we want it done safely people, we, we now are probably getting to the point in the United States where herd immunity is going to be achieved, mainly because almost everybody in the United States has either been exposed to, to the vaccine or to the virus in, in the wild naturally, or they've gotten vaccinated against it. As a result, now it's less of an issue in terms of public health policy because those people, the, the majority of the people have been exposed. They're, they can safely be exposed to COVID-19 and probably not get sick to the point of dying. The thing to realize is this, that came at the expense of hundreds of thousands of lives uh, worldwide. Hundreds of thousands of people have died from COVID-19 simply because we didn't have vaccines ready. We, we didn't have the resources to manage that many people being exposed to a potentially, to a potentially deadly pathogen. And worldwide, we've lost millions of people over the last few years to COVID-19 as a result of this. The other thing to realize about herd immunity is this. People not getting vaccinated when they have the option have a negative impact on people who can't get vaccinated at all. In any population, there is a proportion of people who cannot get vaccinated. These are people who have immunocompromising conditions. Maybe they have childhood cancer. Maybe they have some other type of immunodeficiency like SCID uh, or, or DeGeorge syndrome or some other type of, of disease that prevents them from being able to get vaccines against things. And that usually ranges between one and 3% of any country's population. So if you realize that we need to have somewhere between 94 and 96% of the population immunized against something to really be certain we have herd immunity, there's already two or 3% of the population that can't get vaccinated anyways, which means the margin for people voluntarily choosing not to be vaccinated is really, really small if we're going to get lasting and effective herd immunity against these. So herd immunity works. But it only works if we understand how herd immunity confers immunity within a population and we understand the repercussions of people not being immune to that. If we understand like when people are just deciding not to get safe and healthy vaccinations to fight off an infection. So today we talked about the different types of immunity. We know that there uh, is natural and artificial immunity, and we know that natural and artificial immunity could either be an active form of immunity or a passive form of immunity. 
We also talked at length about a specific type of artificial active immunity vaccinations. We talked about how there are um, non-infectious routes like mRNA vaccinations, subunit vaccinations, inactivated virus vaccinations, things like that. And there are also, uh, you know, attenuated virus vaccines where we use sort of a mutated, less pathogenic version of the virus. Both routes of vaccinations have their pros and their cons. We also talked a little bit about herd immunity and remembering that herd immunity does work, but the key is developing herd immunity in a way that's safe for everyone in the population. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope that you tune in to uh, some of my future videos and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.